Time has just gone four minutes past uh, 8 uh, p.m. as uh, we continue with Wednesday nights with myself, United Wadi. And uh, earlier on, we spoke about blasphemy and we spoke about the Indian government and uh, the statements that were made against our beloved Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And uh, we're talking about blasphemy tonight and blasphemers of another sort. We're talking about the movie, uh, we're talking about the movie Lady of Heaven that has uh, created a huge uh, uh, concerns and at the same time a uh, protest against the screening of this movie. And joining us uh, this evening, Alhamdulillah, uh, member of Hizbut Tahrir, uh, Mazar Khan and uh, Jamal Haud, senior economic analyst for Hizbut Tahrir in the United Kingdom. Uh, <coughs> as we welcome both uh, our guests this evening, Brother Mazar, you're on top of the screen. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. It's always welcome and wonderful having you with us. Walaikum salam wa rahmatullah. And uh, once again, Jazakallah khair for inviting me to share and, views and opinions on your show. Yes, and also to Brother Jamal Hawood. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And uh, as we were talking earlier on when we were doing the test, it's been long coming. And uh, alaykum wonderful that you're able to join us. Wa alaikum as salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Yes, it's my pleasure. Uh, to be on your program. Uh, looking forward to it. Right. Mother, let's just uh, talk about, uh, you know, we are talking about blasphemy <coughs> and blasphemy is rife right across the entire world. We've seen what has happened in India and earlier on I had an hour long uh, discussion. And I think before we get to this movie uh, issue, uh, you know, just to talk about blasphemy in general and we've seen it evolve over a period of time. We've seen it right across the world. We've seen it in the Western world, whether we're talking about Europe, we're talking about the United States of America. We see how it's manifested itself in India recently as well. And uh, just before we get to the movie itself, just your thoughts on how this has evolved over a period of time. Um, it has, um, you know, it, it rears its ugly head from time to time. And I think in the, the recent history, it takes quite an ideological slant. Um, and it's, uh, it takes a very toxic uh, uh, coloring as well. So, I mean, we are old enough to remember the, the, the furore that was created by Salman Rushdie, you know, 30, 40 years ago. Um, and what is interesting is when Salman Rushdie wrote that book, uh, Blasphemous, the entire Western establishment was supported him and backed him. And the British government spent literally millions of pounds in protecting him. And he really was a nobody. But the reason they protected him is because they were he was attacking the Muslims. And the, the, the West saw this as a way to champion their belief in freedom, their belief in uh, 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 the right to say whatever you want, which we now know, and we knew at the time, is, is deeply not just hypocritical, but uh, nonsensical, because no nation in the world is allowed to say and do whatever they want. Every single nation in the world has laws and regulations and limits to curtail the behavior of people of what is consider, considered decent. So when it comes to Islam, they want to be blasphemous. They want to be provocative, um, not for any intellectual purpose, because we can have debates and we can have intellectual discourse about the, the, the truthfulness of Islam. But they come from a very vindictive uh, position in order to demonize Islam. And we find very well, I mean, even you spoke to your previous guest about how uh, Islam is, is viewed around the world and how certain countries don't say certain things because every nation protects its values and every nation has rules and regulations. So in France, in France, you cannot uh, speak badly about the Republic. It is a criminal offense. You know, in certain European countries, you can't deny the Holocaust. It is a criminal offense. So this whole thing about freedom of speech and being allowed to say anything, they themselves don't believe in it. They themselves don't believe in it. They themselves don't practice it, but they use it as a stick. And that's why as Muslims, we should wise up, you know, and we should not feel that, you know what, we need, we need to be diplomatic and we need to be uh, careful in what we say. Yes, we need to be careful in what we say, but we must not feel that it is not allowed for the Muslims to feel offended and hurt when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam or his family or his companions or ridiculed or mocked because we as Muslims love the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or we are told to love the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam more than we love ourselves. 
So I doubt if the people in the West or the East can ever understand that because they don't have that concept or that kind of love for anybody else other than themselves. So this is something uh, unique to this Ummah and this is something that we need to protect and, uh, and demonstrate to the world that this is a red line and this is something we will never to to tolerate. Yes, uh, Jazakallah for that, Mazhar. And Jamal, uh, we'd just like to add to what Mazhar has been mentioning. And uh, obviously, you uh, use very strong words, and rightly so. These are words that we need to use. You know, we talk about a toxic uh, environment where we find that blasphemy is becoming more and more toxic. It is becoming more apparent. It's becoming more brazen. And all of this, and as Mazhar also pointed out, because of the vindictiveness. And uh, if you'd just like to basically add to that, and uh, we will then continue. Yes, yes. Uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Um, I remember when I embraced Islam back in the mid-80s, 1980s, and uh, one of the first uh, uh, protests I went on with Muslims, um, I was getting involved in you know, political activism, and uh, one of the first ones that I got involved with was actually a film about a film called The Last Temptation of Christ. Uh, you, 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 people of a certain age may remember it, but it was really an awful film. And uh, of course, the point is, is that blasphemy, uh, if it's directed at the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or indeed any of the prophets, uh, is unacceptable and Muslims need to speak out and need to actually say that, you know, that we, we will not condone and accept this. And, and alhamdulillah, you know, as, as Maza mentioned, you know, satanic verses and, and all of the many, uh, you know, the cartoons, controversy uh, in, in France, uh, Charlie Hebdo and, you know, all of these things are there to really provoke Muslims and to really denigrate Islam in the eyes of the public. And, uh, you know, so we, we really, it's very important for us to stand up and actually uh, make our point in terms of this, that this is uh, unacceptable. Um, we don't have this concept of uh, absolute freedom of speech. You know, you cannot go and attack uh, anyone. Um, you know, over this last weekend, uh, there was the Queen's, you know, the British Queen's Jubilee celebrations, you know, 70 years. And uh, I can, I can, you know, assure you that if anyone was actually, uh, you know, going down in, in, into the mall and anywhere else and, and would be at, at, attacking the queen, you know, verbally or, or, you know, the institution of monarchy and all of this type of stuff, you know, they, they, would have been, they would have been arrested and they would have been locked up and all of this type of thing because there's certain matters that societies will, will not accept. Uh, uh, and obviously in Islam, uh, you know, the, the point of attacking uh, the companions attacking the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and, and these, these core essentials uh, in, in uh, Islam is, is really uh, uh, beyond the pale. Yes, and Mother, uh, it is obvious, you know, when we're talking about uh, provocation, there are deeper issues, there are underlying issues that are playing out. And just to understand the thinking, the rationale, the, 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 the agenda behind this provocation, and what uh, it is aimed to achieve. You know, one of the angles or aspects uh, of this, uh, the, this issue is they like to frame it as blasphemy, as if it's something religious, something which is not real, something that, you know, uh, from a bygone era. But the concept of blasphemy also applies to Western secular beliefs and Western secular ideals. So like Jamal just mentioned now, the, uh, the, the, uh, the institution of the queen, you know, it is not allowed to touch the queen by protocol. You know, like the West will uh, uh, rebuke the Muslims saying, oh, why do you not shake hands with the opposite sex? You know, so certain Muslims have these practice that we don't, you know, engage with other women. We don't touch other women, et cetera, et cetera. In Britain, it is not allowed to touch the queen. You know, that's why she always wears a glove if she ever shakes hands with anybody. Um, and certain things like that, like uh, Jamal mentioned Charlie Hebdo, you know, Charlie Hebdo, uh, when this furore happened uh, 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 some years ago, it came in the news that Ch Charlie Hebdo, the magazine itself, fired a journalist from its own magazine because they mocked the Holocaust or something uh, to, to do with the Holocaust. So 
they also have this concept of blasphemy that we don't undermine certain core beliefs that we hold. So like in France, I, as I mentioned in my introduction, it's blasphemous in France to speak against the Republic, you know? And so when they talk about blasphemy, they try to uh, put down religious people, but they themselves do have this concept of blasphemy, blasphemy applied to their beliefs. And their beliefs are irrational and impractical because they claim freedom of speech. They don't believe it. We don't claim freedom of belief. We claim responsible speech. We, we, we claim that as a human being, you are responsible and accountable for everything that you say and do uh, in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we, we, we call a spade a spade, that we are all responsible and accountable for everything we do. And we live by that ideal and we maintain that ideal. So even as a Muslim, we dislike somebody, we are not allowed to be unfair to them. Even if we might dislike somebody, we are not allowed to take their rights away, which is why the Islamic government in its hundreds of years of history, when the Islamic rule existed, non-Muslims felt secure because they knew that whether the Muslims liked us or did not like us, they still have to protect us and provide our needs. Whereas if you look in the West, now in the West, if you are a non-white living in Britain, your citizenship is not guaranteed. You can be kicked out. So even if you are born in Britain, even if your father is born in Britain, but your grandfather was born in some country that you have never set foot in, you can have your citizenship, citizenship revoked and you can be expelled to that third country that you have never been to. Whereas in Islam, it is a duty on the Muslims to fight and die for the Ahli Dhimma. So we operate in two different laws and our standards and our beliefs and our values are superior and their beliefs and their values are hypocritical that they themselves don't live up to. And as soon as push comes to shove, they jettison their values, whether it's in freedom, whether it's liberalism, whatever is it they claim to blame. And this is the attribute of kufr. Kufr will always, always contradict itself. Yes. Now, Jamal, just coming to this movie and the protests against this movie, Lady in Heaven, and we have learned that uh, obviously they pulled the, uh, the movie off the screens uh, right now of, this, of the big screen. But uh, it is clear that uh, Muslims in Britain uh, have come out very, very strongly to raise their voices, to protest, because uh, when one looks at uh, movies of this nature, obviously, uh, as uh, Mother pointed out, that uh, we are, when we're talking about blasphemy, we're talking about not only against the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but the Ahlul Bayt as well, the family of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, his noble wives, uh, our noble mothers as well. So all of that put together, but uh, it is clear that Muslims, and from these protests, it is clear that Muslims will not take kindly when we have uh, issues like this movie, Ladies in Heaven Arising. Yes, I mean, um, there's so many matters which, uh, you know, um, are broken, you know, by this. I mean, for example, uh, depicting the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is, is a, you know, is a clear forbidden matter. You know, you cannot uh, attempt to depict with an actor or computer generated images or anything of that nature, uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or indeed his family. And this is what they have, you know, the main characters uh, presented uh, being the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Imam Ali, Radiallahu Fatima, uh, and then of course uh, other companions, uh, Omar, Abu Bakr, uh, Radiallahu you know, but presented in a, in a very negative light, uh, uh, you know, which, which is what this, this question of inflaming this sort of sectarianism, uh, which, which is a, a matter that we're concerned by. You know, not only are you breaking uh, the rules in terms of uh, depicting the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and, and his family, but you're, you're presenting a, you know, a story which is, uh, which is factually incorrect and uh, is, is alluded to this sort of Shia Sunni uh, analogies, uh, which uh, all they are doing is actually inflaming or trying to inflame divisions between you know, uh, different schools of thought, uh, rather than actually deal with the real clear focus. I mean, the film, I believe, I haven't seen it, I'm not going to go see the film, but I believe opens in, uh, 
in, in Iraq, you know, a more modern day setting in Iraq, uh, you know, which is occupied, occupied land, you know, in terms of the Americans, you know, you know, this is the, this is the, the, the latter day problem is that we don't have Islam, we don't have authority. Um, never mind whether the, the, the first Khalifa uh, was, was Abu Bakr or, or Omar or Uthman or Ali, you know, th this, this, this is the question of today is actually we, we don't have a, a leadership today, we don't have Islam. And, and hence we, our lands are divided and uh, Iraq, for example, was, was brutally occupied and, and is still in a complete mess today. So, so why on earth somebody wants to start making a film to uh, create divisions between uh, Muslims of different schools of thought on the sectarian, uh, sectarianism uh, is, is really there to just create division and to try and weaken the Muslims. This is not the burning issue of the Muslims today. You know, uh, the burning issue today is the fact that our lands are occupied, our lands are divided, and uh, we're without you know, the, the authority in our lands has been taken over by regimes and ty tyrants. You know, this is this is really the, the burning issue. Why, why don't they make a film about that? This is what they should be sp putting their money into, not, not, not trying to create uh, sectarian divisions. Mm. Mother, what do we know about uh, the person and he's uh, been under the radar now with the uh, screening of the movie uh, Yasser al-Habib? Uh, who has actually written the screenplay. What do we know about him? Uh, I'll be honest with you. Personally, I don't know too much about this guy, other than the fact that it, he is a well-known divisive figure um, and he is a very sectarian uh, person, uh, to the extent that many Shia in the UK have demonstrated against him. So many Shia themselves in the UK have protested against this film because they're saying this is not acceptable. So even amongst the Shia, he is seen as a bit of a loose cannon, a bit of a troublemaker, and, and, and a bit of a, uh, you know, a person that should not be trusted. Um, and to be honest, when we look at this film made by this guy in Iraq, what interest is it to the West about this, right? It's, it's not, not of interest to them. But the reason it is of interest is because they are trying to cause fitna and division and and trouble and, and, and uh, disputes in the Muslim world because they have not been able to achieve what they wanted to achieve. So when the Americans went to Iraq, 20 years, they spent trillions of dollars and they had to leave without achieving what they wanted to achieve. They went to Afghanistan, 20 years, trillions of dollars spent, they had to leave. So now in the old classical way of colonialism is divide and rule, cause fitna. And Muslims should realize that Sunnis and Shias have lived in Asham in the eastern part of Saudi Arabia, in parts of Iraq, in, in large parts of the Muslim world for over a thousand years. And there is a British academic, I forget his name. He wrote a book um, uh, uh, over a decade ago. And what was fascinating was his insight. He said, what is surprising about the Sunni Shia division? is the absence of violence. The, 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 what is notable about the Muslim Shia division is the absence of violence. He goes, they have lived together for over a thousand years, but there's no wars. He goes, whereas in Europe, we had the hundred day war. We had perpetual war between Christian factions, between the Protestants, between the Catholics, and having all sorts of different pogroms and having um, inquisitions amongst the Europeans. So there was always warfare in Europe. But what this person said was what was surprising is that the Sunni Shias, they had no wars. So Muslims and Shias, yes, we've got disagreements. We've got disputes with one another, but we managed to live with one on one another for over a thousand years in, 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 in the Sham and in the Arab world and in the non-Arab world. So this division has been inflamed for the last 30, 40, 50 years since 1979. Iran and Saudi Arabia have inflamed this you know, for their own political agenda. And this is falling into the, to the agenda of the Western masters that look after that area. They are happy for the Saudis to come out with slander against the Shia. And they are happy for the Shias to come out against with slander against the Sunnis because this causes division amongst these people so they can never live together. But we need to understand that when Islam was applied in these lands, 
that Muslims, even though we may have disagreements and disputes and uh, different opinions on certain matters, it didn't result in conflict and people live together in harmony. So we should rise above this and understand that this, what's happening with this movie is an agenda inflamed by certain people who want to keep the Muslim Ummah divided and in a case of perpetual turmoil so they can manage to have their authority over our lands. When it is the right of this Ummah to be united and it's the right of this Ummah to be the caretakers of, of the land. Yes, and uh, also Jamal, uh, just following up from what Madhuri is saying, uh, it is clear that uh, they have succeeded uh, as far as uh, the division is concerned and uh, even if it takes uh, people like Yasser al-Habib to do it. Yeah, no, I mean, you know, I believe uh, something like a budget of 15 million pounds, you know, for this film. You know, this shows you the amount that they're pushing into this type of project. Um, and we know that media in today's world is powerful. You know, there, you know, there's no two ways about it. You know, whether that's YouTube or Netflix or BBC or, or, or Hollywood or, or whatever, Bollywood, you know, all of this stuff. I, I'm, I'm no expert, obviously, on, 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 on many of these things. But I'm saying is that, that this is the, the modern day, you know, medium uh, of pushing ideas. You know, so 15 million pounds invested into this fi film uh, is not for artistic, you know, matters. It's, it's for basically to try and create division fitna, as Maza says, you know, between uh, the Muslims. And we've had differences of opinion, uh, you know, it's from the time of the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I mean, the, the basic position is, is that, you know, my opinion is right, but it could be wrong. And his opinion is wrong, but it could be right. You know, so there's, there's a basic respect between the scholars, between the ulama. And, and this is a pos position between, you know, Shafi, Hanafi, Malik, Hanbal, you know, all, all of the, the great classical scholars uh, is, is one of, of respect and debate. You know, very strong debate. But, but you know, as, as Maza said, you know, it's not, not a question of coming to blows or, 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 or violence between uh, opinions. And uh, the important thing is, is that without a, a Khalifa, and again, I would remind your, your, your viewers that uh, the, the Shia and the Sunni are in full agreement that we must have a Khalifa or an Imam, you know, meaning the same thing as the Prophet Sallallahu said in one Hadith, he that dies without the bayah on his neck to an Imam dies a death of Jahiliyyah. In, in the book of uh, Bukhari. So the question is, is that if you don't have an imam, if you don't have a khalifa uh, ruling over us uh, with the contract of bayah between the Muslims and the khalifa, then the Muslims are sinful and there's a very serious matter. So there's no doubt upon this in terms of all the main schools of thought, Shia and Sunni. So why on earth uh, would we spend any attention towards those that want to create sectarian divisions between this school of thought or that school of thought, that this is uh, completely unacceptable. And, and even on, in, in the times when, in which uh, some Khalifas overstepped stood the, the mark, for example, trying to make adoption in terms of personal ibadah, uh, you know, the, the scholars spoke out a, a, against this. So it's not really for a matter for, for um, those in authority to start to interfere in terms of, you know, where, whether you are Shia or, or Sunni or Shafi or Hanafi, you know, the, the, in terms of the, the Imam you follow and in terms of un your understanding of Islam. The, the, this, these are matters which we study and we debate, but it's not to be imposed upon people. And uh, mm. this idea of, of uh, sectarianism is really rejected in, in Islam. Yes, Jamal, Jazakallah for that. And uh, Mazar, I think what is also uh, important to understand is uh, now that we've learned that uh, the film has been taken off the screens and uh, we know that we are going to get critics and they're calling it shameful uh, censorship, uh, you know, Islamic mobs uh, are dictating what needs to be shown, what, what doesn't need to be shown. But at the end of the day, I think what is this this is demonstrated once again 
the power of the Muslim Ummah, particularly in situations like this, where we have the capacity, where we have the ability as ordinary people, people on the ground to change the situation. No, absolutely, Inayat. You know, uh, you make a very interesting point there, actually, because not just this issue about the film, but the, the, the issue you were discussing b b before we came on about what's happened in India with the with the Indian uh, uh, spokesperson of BJP is saying, uh, you know, disgusting things. Um, um, there would have been no response from anybody had it not been for the common man in the street who has have, uh, who has a bond with his iman and his deen that we stand up and we protest. And we make a noise. And then the leaders follow. They never take the initiative. They only follow when they think, all right, this is a bit too hot. We need to say something because our silence is a bit embarrassing. So it always goes to show it is always the small man on the street that brings the challenge or rather stands up for the cause of Islam. And, you know, it shouldn't be like this. It shouldn't be like this. Rather, we need somebody big to defend us and somebody, our leader, to speak on behalf of the Muslims. And this is the crux of the matter. Because we are now dealing, we are on the defensive. They are accusing us. They are challenging us. They are interfering in our lands, our people, and our beliefs. And the reason they are doing that, Brother Inayat, is because we are not taking the challenge to them. They shouldn't have the time to speak about us. They should be busy defending the nonsense and the contradictions and the falsehoods that they believe in. We should be challenging them not they challenging us. And this is why this is happening, is because we are absent in the field of the ideological struggle. Just now, I mean, it's almost laughable that India wants to speak bad about Islam. I mean, this is laughable. India wants to speak bad about Islam. Modi and that Sharma woman and the BJP know full well what Islam is. They know full well of the history of Islam and what Islam did to India. It... it, it, it beautified India, it glorified India to such an extent that three European powers tried to come and occupy India. It was so wealthy. Even to this day, when people go to visit India, they go and see Muslim India, Taj Mahal, Fatapur Sikri, uh, uh, Qutum Minar, uh, Lal Killa, all these things, uh, uh, Jamia Masjids in Delhi. It's all Muslim history they're going to see. Islam is what beautified India. India has got no right to attack Islam. India is famous for having the most amount of people defecating in public because they don't have public toilets. They treat their people like animals and they treat their animals like gods. This is the hypocrisy and the jahiliya that has engulfed India and they are attacking Islam. They are in no position to attack Islam, you know. And because we Muslims don't have our own ideological states, Carrying the da'wah to the world. When Rasulullah established Islam and the Sahaba took the baton and took it across the world, the, the message of Islam, those people didn't have a chance to uh, attack Islam. The Muslims were taking the challenge to them and Islam was being co conveyed to them and they were being convinced of Islam. It's only when we started to preoccupy ourselves with our lives that the West and the East started to challenge Islam. But our job is to give them da'wah not for them, for not for us to receive that one from them and to respond to that. So we're in a weak position. So what you say is absolutely correct. These demonstrations is a goodness of the ummah, the, the, the boycotts and everything is the goodness of the ummah trying to defend Islam. But we need to be in a position of strength, not in a position of weakness to respond to this stuff. Yes, and uh, Mother, just, uh, you know, on that point and uh, I thought it may, and I think I recall, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, I recall during the time of Sultan Abdul Hamid, I think there was a play in London uh, or in Paris, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, no. just reading the his, uh, story of, uh, and at that point in time, the position that Sultan Abdul Hamid had taken. You know, very interesting, because you know, that book was written by a British playwright. And what actually happened is Abdullah Quilliam, whom you must have heard of, is a very famous convert in Britain. He read that book because the author was connected to him. He was a friend of his brother. When he read the book, Abdullah Quilliam wrote two letters. One letter he wrote to India because he knew that the, 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 the huge uh, population of Muslims in there you know, could cause a problem for the British Empire if they stood up and started to make a noise. And he wrote another letter to Sultan Abdul Hamid to tell him what was going on. And this is why Sultan Abdul Hamid 
you know, put an end to the play. But what is interesting is this, that Sultan Abdul Hamid acted before there was any slander or any blasphemy. He demanded that the play was cancelled. And the British said, oh, we can't cancel the play. We've already, you know, organized it. He said, well, if you don't cancel it, just know that the only thing that separates me and you is the English Channel. And I, my army can be there within a day and I will declare jihad -e akbar And the Muslims in India will come and fight you. So the British knew that, okay, this is now too much for us to handle. And what is interesting for almost 100 years after that, Britain never, ever insulted the Prophet until Salman Rushdie came. They knew the significance of this. So Sultan Abdul Hamid taught them a lesson that they kept quiet for a hundred years because he responded. Today, we've got cowardly rulers that they wait for the Prophet to be insulted. They wait for the Muslims to be humiliated. And then they come out with token gestures and boycott. Coming out with boycotts is not befitting for the honor of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So Sultan Abdul Hamid acted before they acted. Now we retrospectively act, and even that is not befitting the, the honor of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Yes, and uh, also, uh, Jamal, just to bring you back into the discussion, and uh, as Mazar mentioned, uh, there is no room for, uh, you know, half-hearted measures. There is no room for weak uh, responses, particularly at a time like this. And as the Muslims in Britain had demonstrated that, you know, they're going to go they're going to follow this right through to the point that uh, the movie was taken off the cinema screens. And this is exactly what a Muslim should do. And uh, talking about leadership, again, uh, you know, linking with the blasphemy that has taken place in India as well. Uh, just how sincere has the OIC been? Just how sincere has the leadership been? Is it a half-hearted measure? Is time going to tell us that it's going to be business as usual I, I after think, a think... few weeks when everything yeah. dies down? I think what we're seeing is we're seeing the result of pressure coming from the Ummah. You know, the, as you say, the, these regimes uh, in the Muslim world, um, you know, they're not going to take any initiative against Modi. You know, they didn't actually go and threaten to cut off his oil su supplies. You know, they didn't uh, say that they're going to cut trade. I mean, these are minimal measures that they should be doing. They didn't do any of that. Uh, but they did make some noises and Muslims have started to boycott their goods um, as they do routinely uh, in relation to the Zionist entity and, and other occupying entities around the, the Muslim world. So the, the Ummah, you know, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi said, there's good in me and my Ummah to Yom Al-Qiyamah. So, so the Ummah has good within it and that parts are responding. Alhamdulillah. So, you know, I believe 120,000 Muslims in, in Britain signed a petition for this film to be stopped. And Cineworld uh, has agreed not, not to, to show it. Uh, I don't know about other cinemas, but, you know, this is, this is a minimal action, really. This is a very uh, minimal matter. And, 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 and the greater action, because this is not going to stop. You know, this is one provocation. What's going to be provocation next week? What is going to be the week after that? Because as long as the Ummah is in a weakened position, a divided position, a position without proper authority and leadership, then uh, these uh, Kuffar and their states are going to be taking pot shots, uh, not only against the Prophet Sallallahu but also against the Quran, also against Islam in, in, in general, and of course against the Muslims. We see what's happening in Xinjiang province in, in uh, in uh, China, uh, in, in East Turkestan, and, and we see what's happening in Kashmir. We can see what's happening in the, you know, occupied Palestine. You know, is that when the Ummah is without leadership, this is what's going to happen. Is actually where we're going to be see this occupation and death and destruction uh, against us. So, so this is really the the key matter for us. You know, yes, we have to stand up and protest at this blasphemy and this type of attack against the Prophet ﷺ and his family and his companions. We have to do that. And, and alhamdulillah, we are seeing that. But the bigger struggle, the struggle which I really encourage your viewers to get involved with is actually solving this political one. Because as long as the Ummah is without a Khalifa, without a, a proper authority, you know, without, a, you know, a latter-day Sultan Abdul Hamid, 
you know, there's nobody to, to stop this happening and, and worse atrocities continuing. Uh, and again, it's on our necks. This is an obligation on our necks. So this is really what we should learn from this particular thing is that, you know, the French government is going to be attacking Islam with cartoons and, and, and the British government is going to be funding the Yasser al-Habibs of this world and others. I'm, I'm not saying the British government funded him, but I'm just saying is that they, they house him. They, they, he's, he has uh, refugee, he was given refugee status in, in, in Britain, lives in London, I believe. You know, so the point is, is that they're going to encourage uh, people like this uh, because it serves their political ends. So we shouldn't be naive. We need to direct towards the core problem. The core problem in our land is this intellectual revival to bring back Islam as a deen, as a way of life, and, and to take back the authority from these regimes which are keeping us from the implementation of Islam, whether that is in Pakistan or whether that is in Egypt or Turkey or, or the, the major uh, Muslim lands. This is really what the focus has got to be. Yes, and uh, also, Bazar, uh, you know, just to reinforce uh, uh, at a time like this, uh, whether we're talking about uh, the blasphemy in India or the movie, the concept of one ummah. And I think this was demonstrated very, very clearly that we are one ummah because what has been happening in Britain and the protests has been of huge interest to the Muslim world right across the entire world. And that is why I'm referring to the concept of, of one ummah because if Britain was allowed to get away with this, it could have easily mushroomed right across the entire world. And uh, it would have been a major issue right across the entire world. And that is why, you know, as an ummah, in situations like this, we need to be together, we need to stand together, we need to speak out together with one voice. No, absolutely, Brother Inai. What you say there is uh, for all to see. This ummah is one ummah. Uh, the world can try and divide us as much as they like. Our leaders can try and impose fake nationalities and borders upon us to make us feel different from one another. But at the end of the day, a human is a human and what defines him is his belief. And we Muslims have a belief which is a universal belief and which binds us all together. So you're absolutely right. When anything ever happens, whether it's India, you'll find Muslims in different parts of the world respond to that. When, what happens in Palestine? What happens to the Uyghurs? So this is obviously uh, 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 an indication that we are bonded together because we believe and feel the same thing. Whereas if something happens in France, the British don't necessarily get upset because it's a French problem. It's got nothing to do with us. If something happens in Italy, nothing to do with us. But when something happens to the Muslim Ummah anywhere in the world, the whole Ummah sees it as their problem. So we are one Ummah. The only thing that practically divides us are the fake states that they created. When Sultan Abdul Hamid was dethroned and the Khilafah was eventually abolished in 1924. Effectively, when Sultan Abdul Hamid left, I think it was 1918, around that time, you could say the Ottoman Empire was in name only. And it's after that they created these fake states with these fake, fake nationalities, try and convince us that we are different. But we are not different. And we are never different. We are one ummah. And the only thing missing now is to remove the fake borders and to have an imam for the ummah to practically manifest that unity and to practically live by Islam and to convey the message because that's the job of the Muslims. The job of the Muslim is not just to live by Islam but to convey the message to the four corners of the world because the Prophet wasalam, was himself rahmatul lil alameen a mercy to the whole of mankind. So it's our job to take that mercy. And as I mentioned earlier about India, before the Muslims went to India, India was such a backward place, right? In terms of, they didn't even know how to dress. There was nakedness. If you go to some, look at some of the old Hindu temples, they have naked statues around them, almost pornographic, you know? They've got temples in Gujarat that worship rats. They've got temples that worship monkeys. They've got, and this is the kind of darkness they were in. And Islam took the likes of Modi and his people and dignified and honored them by giving them the kalima and, and beautifying that land and enriching that land. So Islam has brought those people out of darkness and they are trying to lie and trying to hide the history of Islam, which they can never do. But it is our job to take that message across the world because that is what we 
are, are, are responsible for to guide the whole of humanity, to guide the Indians, to guide the Americans, to guide the Russians, the Australians, all of them to Islam. But we can only practically do that if we ourselves resume the Islamic way of life by having an Islamic presence at the global stage. Well, certainly. And also, I think, Jamal, you know, um, looking at it from an economic perspective, because we know the entire world uh, revolves around money and uh, around benefit. And, uh, you know, people, obviously, uh, countries, governments, leaders will use, will use each other for their benefit. And uh, when one looks at the Muslim world, there is no shortage of resources. You know, apart from uh, the people on the ground that we've been talking about and we've been talking about the concept of one ummah uh, on the ground when situations arise. But uh, as Muslims, as a Muslim Ummah, we are more powerful in more ways than one, including economic power. But we are not, we are not using this as leverage to uh, alleviate the problems around the world, the suffering of our Muslim brothers and sisters. And uh, just to expand a bit on this, you know, on the Muslim uh, Ummah uh, or the Muslim world that is so rich in resource, yet yeah. we are poor yeah, in more I, I... ways than one. I, I touched on this a bit earlier because the point of, of boycotts, um, you know, this is a very minimal action. You know, we would take nothing, you know, for these regimes in the Middle East, for example, to say, right, we're not going to supply in India with uh, the oil, you know, because it's very dependent on the oil and energy from the Muslim world, as indeed is China and, and many others. So the question is of, of uh, taking these actions, there's no political will there because these are regimes which are basically in the pockets of Western masters, whether that's in Downing Street or that's in, in Washington. You know, they are the ones which are taking uh, their own agenda based upon what the Western powers are dictating. And at the same time, and th this is also the tragedy, is that, you know, these resources, you know, we, we've got energy crunch at the moment you know the price of, of of petrol the price of gas the price of food all of this is going up rapidly and uh they are extracting this uh great resource which allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to us which is a public property you know the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he said the people are partners in three the fire the water the herbage and the fire includes all of this energy this energy and minerals this is a public property it's not something for some sheikh or or a president or emperor you know to to monopolize and 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 uh, you know set up capitalist companies for it this is a public resource and uh so these the prices are going up dramatically uh you know we look at somewhere like pakistan and pakistan because it's 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 uh, energy dependent is now got massive debt to the IMF, and uh, it, it, it's paying something like three trillion rupees, fifty percent, a full fifty percent of its budget of, of its tax revenues, which are raised on paying interest to the IMF. This is interest-bearing loans, compounding loans. Why? Because Iran and Saudi and the other Muslim lands are not sharing this vital resource uh you know this is this is the the tragedy that we see in our lands is that in some corners we are incredibly wealthy in terms of manpower uh, and low on food and other areas were very strong on food and agriculture but lack people in other areas we are very strong in energy this is really what it means to be one ummah, is that we should be sharing these strengths and weaknesses so that it's not a situation where um, every corner of the Muslim world has got certain weaknesses. You know, if we, if we think together, we think as one ummah, we think as one nation, as one state, one uh, khilafah, then we, we'd have no shortages in terms of food, manpower, military, uh, energy, resources, agriculture, you name it, We're, you know, strategic waterways and resources, you know, gold, silver, minerals, you name it. It, it, it's all there. But as long as we allow ourselves to be divided into tiny 
little, you know, cartoon-like states. Just look at the, the Middle East and you can see what I mean. And uh, you, you will understand that this is what divides us and this is what keeps us weak. So, so we have to break those colonial imposed shackles, those colonially imposed borders, because they've got nothing to do with Islam and, and, uh, and Muslims. You know, we have to focus as one nation. We have to break down those borders and use our resources collectively. Yes. And also, Mazar, uh, from what Jamal says, uh, one of the reasons why uh, we cannot uh, complement each other is, uh, I see, I think uh, Mazar uh, is, uh, I'm not too sure whether he's uh, on screen, but yep, uh, maybe you. Jamal, you, okay. Uh, I can hear you. There yeah. we go. Okay. Sorry. There was just a slight delay getting you back on screen, Mazar. One of the reasons why we can't complement each other, and as Jamal mentioned, that there is actually no shortage of resources. There is no shortage of manpower. There is no shortage of skills. There is no shortage of, uh, of expertise. But uh, what there is a shortage of, and I know you are passionate about this, uh, is uh, you know an international uh, intellectual vacuum, particularly amongst the leadership, to see the bigger picture for the benefit of the Muslim Ummah. No, the thing is absolutely what Jamal said and what you've just echoed there. We have so many strengths, but our preachers and our leaders try to convince us that we are weak and in a position of weakness when the reality is different. And it's actually the West that recognizes that fact that we are up in a position of strength, which is why they need to keep us divided. And that's why we need to have a little bit more self-respect, a little bit of decency and intellectual sincerity when we discuss these issues. And we should not be on the back foot. So when they talk their nonsense, about oh uh, freedom of speech and all this nonsense just 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 know that britain is in no position to talk about these things so for example i mean people know this that in britain they ban so many people from speaking in this country they ban so many people from entering into this country on the pretext of hate speech so suddenly now they don't believe in freedom so we know that zakir naik was banned from entering into this country even people who are not controversial like or, or, or not political like Bilal Phillips, Zakir Naik, they've been banned. Louis Farrakhan, he's been banned. Many, many people have been banned from coming here because they talk about, because uh, on the pretext of hate speech. Yet this man, Yasser al-Habib, not only lives in London, as uh, uh, Jamal correctly mentioned, he is allowed to put out the most filthiest and devices and hate-filled film, and that is now freedom of speech. So. That hypocrisy, that, you know, bankruptcy, we should see. So we should not take any lessons from the West. We should not take any kind of morals or ethics from these people and know that they have a political ideological agenda and they use events like this in order to beat the Muslims, to keep them weak, to keep them divided and to convince them. And some of the preachers that follow and, and, and told this line is that we are so useless and helpless, we can do nothing. We need to throw these shackles away and realize that it's the picking on this ummah because they understand that if we didn't pick on this ummah and it got together, it would dominate the world. And they know that, which is why day and night they play games like this. And we should wise up to that. Yes, uh, Jamal, in your analysis, uh, throwing these shackles away, as Mother mentioned, uh, what do we do? How do we throw these uh, shackles away? Well, the, the Muslims, we need to be politically active. Um, in so many places in the Quran and, and, and Sunnah, um, we're commanded to command maruf and forbid munkar. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Imran, وَتَقُمْ مِنْكُمْ أُمَّةٍ يَرْعُونِ الْخَيَةِ وَيَعْمَرُونَ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَيَنْحَوْنَ أَوْ مُنْكَرْ وَأُولَٰئِكَهُمُ مُفْلَهُونَ You know, um, let there arise from amongst you a group or groups calling to khair, calling to Islam. Commanding maruf, commanding what is right, and forbidding munkar, speaking out against the evil. And they are those that shall have success. You know, so this is an evidence that says that there, there needs to be political movements. So there needs to be a political movement or political movements. Um, Mazar and myself, we work with Hizb Tahrir as example. Um, we've been working since, not personally, but, but as a movement since 1953. 
uh, to to uh, revive and bring back the, the caliphate, the, the Khilafah. So, so this is the biggest munker that we have today is that we don't actually have the, the political authority. We don't actually have the bayah. We don't have the, the rules and laws of the deen being implemented in our land. So this is really our burning priority. And, uh, you know, so, so get politically active. You know, this is my, my, my first point is that, uh, you know, it's not going to just happen. You know, the, the, the Muslims have the responsibility uh, to follow the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he worked, he worked tirelessly uh, with his companions uh, to carry the message and uh, ultimately was given Nusra, was given support in Yathrib uh, from uh, the Aus and Khazraj, you know, to establish the first Islamic state in Medina. So, so we're actively seeking this Nusra as well. We're seeking the support, you know, military, economic, Political, you know, the, the the you know tribal leaders, all of these these are the key people which actually have, you know, the levers of power in their hands, you know. So we need to be contacting these people so that, that so that they are supporting this call, you know, for change. Because people can see what's happening. They can see that we're, you know, that the, the resources are wasting away. They can see that our lands are being made more and more weak, and and that the political control that the West is exercising is no different from what it was in, in the height of colonialism, you know, post-1924 when the Khilafah was destroyed, those really dark days, you know, they're just as dark, you know, because, you know, we supposedly had independence, but the independence gave from, you know, one, one uh, ruler who, who was in, in the pay of the, the British or the Americans or the French or so on, to another ruler, which, which was maybe a local guy, but he's still in the pay and, and the support of, of the Western powers. So we have to break that. We have to actually take back that control, take back that authority. And it needs two things. It really needs a vast public opinion amongst the Muslims that we need Khilafah and the Khilafah is the only solution that we have. So we really have to push this, uh, you know, here we are talking about blasphemy tonight, but it gets back to the question of Where's the real political authority to actually do anything about blasphemy? And that is, you know, via, via the political authority. And, of course, the second point is that we need Nusra. We need support. We need support of those which can actually make a change. You know, the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he had the first pledge and the second pledge of Aqaba. This was the leadership. This was the military leaders, this was the, the, the tribal leaders of Yathrib that were giving him a pledge to support him, to defend him, and to implement Islam. And in return for that, they were promised Jannah. What a bargain. What a bargain. What a transaction. You know, they were promised Jannah to support the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now, now, there's only two times in history in which the Muslims are in this situation. You know, one was in the, those years, the Meccan period, in which those first companions were working with the Prophet ﷺ, carrying the dawah and seeking the Nusra. And, you know, these are the, 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 you know, the pillars upon which, which uh, we are standing on their shoulders. And then the second community of Muslims is since 1924, which hasn't had the bayah, hasn't had a khalifa. So we're in that time which we have to work in the way the Prophet ﷺ worked with his companions to pass this message to the ummah, to the people, and seek this nusra. You know, it's very unique. You can't do this when there is a khalifa. You can't be seeking nusra. You can't be, you know, giving a dawah to establish an Islamic state when there is an Islamic state. But we are in the, the, that time and we need to seek that uh, reward. We need to seek that, those actions for the sake of Islam and for the sake of this ummah. Yes, uh, yes uh, we are obviously, we've got about two minutes or so to go. Uh, Mother, uh, just final thoughts? I think just to, just to echo what uh, Jamal said there, uh, what's uh, very in interesting is that he's very right that when the Sahaba lived without an authority, the Prophet wasallam led them to Medina, they established authority. No Muslim has ever in that time lived without an Islamic authority until our era, this modern era in the last hundred years. 
and Islam is going to come back. The authority is going to come back. And we have been told through the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that an army will be sent to India to liberate it a second time. So they will see our response. We will liberate India a second time. And we have been also told in the Quran that Al-Aqsa will be liberated a second time before the end of time. And that too will happen. And we know this will happen when the second Khilafah Rashida returns. The first Khilafah Rashida was of Abu Bakr, Abdul Ali radiallahu an, uh, and, and the second Khilafah Rashida is what the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam promised us. And when that comes, these people will get their befitting response to what they have been doing today to the Ummah and to the honor of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Well, Jazakallah khairan so much for that, uh, Mazhar Khan and also Jamal Hawood. Uh, we do appreciate you uh, taking time out, uh, talking to us and being part of this uh, highly informative uh, uh, panel discussion and uh, once again tackling issues that are impacting on the Muslim Ummah right across the entire world. To both of you, Jazakallah khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Well, that brings us to the end of another edition of Wednesday Night with myself, Inayat Wadi, and uh, we trust and hope that you found it highly informative, inspirational, and uh, with it, I'm going to be signing off for myself and the team here at Salah Media. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.